Good morning. Good morning, all. Uh, it's a beautiful fall day. Welcome to church. So good to have you here. Um, I was thinking back to a time uh, when I was about nine years old, and uh, I grew up as a pastor's kid, and so I was at the church a lot of the time. And uh, one of the things that me and one of the other pastor's kids would do was run around the church unsupervised, not recommended, um, but it was a different time and age. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that uh, we, w we figured out was where the secret stash supply of candy was in the church that they would use to restock. It, we basically, we had this uh, Awana program, like a kid's program, where if you learned Bible verses, then you'd get candy. That's pretty much how I learned the Bible growing up, was not to try to draw closer to God, uh, but to get some good <laughs> Kit Kats. <laughs> and so, uh, but God redeems all things, so here we are. <laughs> but uh, I, I remember one time where uh, we went into the, uh, the old storage closet there. I got the key from my dad's office, and me and the other pastor's kid, you know, broke in. We were feeling all, you know, pretty cool at this point and stole a couple Laffy Taffies. Uh, I even remember, like, I got the yellow Laffy Taffies because those ones, as the kids say, hit different. And so, it's not a literal thing, just so you know, okay. So, I, uh, we, we ate those up and, you know, tried to discard of the evidence, and five minutes later, my dad came down and said, hey, Jonathan, did you steal any candy? And I remember looking him square in the eyes at 10 years old and saying, no, I didn't do that. And it's the first time I remember in my life making a bold-faced lie to anybody, uh, let alone to my dad. And uh, the lesson to my kids, if you're listening, is that dad always knows. <laughs> so don't try anything. But I, I remember in that moment when my dad called me out and said, I, I, I know what you did. And actually, what's even a bigger deal than you taking this piece of candy is now that you've lied to me. So we had a whole processing talk, and I remember feeling real convicted. I went and like apologized to the kid's pastor and, and things of this nature. But have you ever been in a situation where you felt pretty horrible after you had done something wrong? Maybe it was something much bigger than uh, stealing a piece of candy from your church. In fact, we actually give out free candy here if you're uh, interested. But have you ever done something where, where it just, it was really hard. You walked away and you're like, man, I, I feel like garbage after I have done that. Maybe you've been in a situation where you've lied or you've stolen or you've lusted or you've been greedy or you lacked empathy or you lacked generosity or you didn't share God's love or you talked down to someone or you treated someone different because of how they looked or talked or you didn't control your anger. You complained without offering a solution. You deceived someone you love. You disobeyed your parents. You got drunk. You coveted your friend's stuff. You thought of yourself as better than others. You didn't follow God's guidelines for healthy sexuality. You were a hypocrite. You mocked someone. Pride creeped up. You used your tongue to tear someone down. You trusted in your own abilities. You trusted in your money. You had unforgiveness in your heart. You weren't thankful or you were arrogant. Might one of those things be you? <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> All of us have made mistakes along the way. And some of them have bigger consequences than others. But all of us have been in that situation where we made a mistake and we felt horrible about it. And the truth is, you might be sitting there thinking today, like, hey, pastor, if you knew the skeletons I had in my closet, like, you would not look at me the same. And maybe what's even more concerning to you is not what I think of you, but you're wondering, what does God think of me? Maybe you're asking the question, could God actually love you after all that you've done? That's what we're going to talk about, and that's what we're going to start to wrestle through today. And we're in a series of teachings over the next many months, straight through the book of the Gospel of Matthew. And there's a lot of things uh, within this whole book that are really helpful. I even got a sneak peek of next week's message where we're going to be talking about a, a fresh take on the Beatitudes. Uh, so I definitely want to invite you to that. But this question that we have that we're asking today, I think is a relevant one and a prevalent one for each and every one of us whether you follow Jesus or not. So let's go to God's word in Matthew chapter four, uh, verses 12 through 22. This is what it says. 
When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in an area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As Jesus was walking beside the sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once, they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Now, I think one of the most important questions we can ever ask in our lifetime, and I think honestly everybody asks, is who is God and what are they like? What is he like? I think each and every one of us has to wrestle through this question. And a lot of people answer that question very differently. Now, Jesus right here is starting his earthly ministry. And uh, he begins by, in verses 15 and 16 in the fourth chapter of Matthew, by quoting the prophet Isaiah from 700 years earlier, from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. And essentially what Jesus is beginning to proclaim here is a proclamation he is going to make throughout the gospel of Matthew, and he made throughout his life. And it is the message that Jesus is saying, I am the Messiah. I am actually God. And here's what I think is uh, interesting about this, is um, when, when I talk to people who do not follow Jesus, who do not believe in him, the, the primary message I hear from others is that, you know, Jesus was a good dude. He was a, he was a good teacher. Like he said some good things. He got his love. Uh, you know, he's about peace and, you know, be kind to your neighbor and things of that nature. And certainly there's, there's a whole segment who um, are very antagonistic towards Jesus, or honestly, it's usually towards Christians or, or somebody who's offended them or, you know, hypocrites, whatever the, the accusation is. But um, the, the most common one I hear is actually a, a positive message about Jesus and about his teachings. And this is what I find most interesting is that Jesus makes the claim over and over again that he is actually God come down in human flesh, like 100% God and 100% man. And this is what I find interesting is that there's this inconsistency in this view between Jesus being a good teacher, and, but he's not really God. And I feel like those two things can't go together. Like you can't believe that Jesus was only a good teacher. He, he, Jesus can be a good teacher, but he can't be only a good teacher. Because here's the thing, if Jesus claims that he is actually God and he is not, and then millions of people are deceived by that claim for years and years, is Jesus really a good dude? I, don't th I wouldn't say so. And in fact, um, I would say like Jesus is either God or he's somebody who needs some serious psychiatric help. Like I, I was scrolling through my feed this week and, and I see this thing pop up that like this, this TikTok influencer is saying on December the 8th that there's going to be aliens that come to our planet. So mark your calendar, <laughs> okay? I didn't read that and think, oh wow, here's somebody I would want to follow and give a lot of time and attention to. I thought, why is this on my feed? How, how did this get here? I, I wouldn't give this person the time of day. And so this is the first question that we have to wrestle with. Is Jesus actually God or not? It's a question each and every one of us has to answer. Because if Jesus is the Messiah, and if he is God's son, then he is Lord of all, 
regardless of whether we accept that as true or not. Either Jesus is crazy or he is Lord. Those are our options that we start with. And Jesus starts his ministry by proclaiming, I am the Messiah. I have come back for you, for humanity, to make a way when there wasn't a way for you to have right relationship with God. That's where he starts. Now, this is what's interesting that happens next in the passage. It says in verse 18, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake because they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and they followed him. And um, right after this, he goes and he invites James and John, who have a very similar story. They drop what they're doing and they decide immediately to go and follow after Jesus. Now, um, sometimes when I'm reading scripture, like I, I can read over something like this and I think like, oh, okay, like this is just an interesting detail. But there's actually something really important theologically that is happening for, uh, that we can learn from this text here. Now, the, the custom in that time was if you were somebody who wanted to go and learn more about God, that you would go and you would find a rabbi, a teacher, and they would teach you all about the scriptures and teach you how to get closer to God. Jesus does something very different, though. Instead of waiting for people to come to him and ask him for instructions, he actually goes and he invites others. And he says, come and follow me. And this is what's really interesting about this is that this rabbi is different than all the other rabbis. Jesus goes out and he seeks after others. And when we ask this question about could God actually love you even after all you have done, we start to see that the character of who Jesus is, is he is somebody who moves towards us, towards us in our pain, towards us in our distraction, towards us in our workplace. Like this is the very character of who Jesus is and what he is like. But there's more to this as well, because the scripture talks about how Jesus went away and he went to Galilee. And there's really interesting things about Galilee and about that place. It is really, in terms of Israel, it's the undesirable place with the undesirable people. Maybe you can think of, of a place on, on our planet that is kind of like that. It, it was, uh, Galilee was the farthest point from Jerusalem. It was the furthest place away from the temple, uh, away from the people of position and power and authority. Uh, Galilee was economically poor. And Galilee was also a region where a lot of trade happened um, and, and went through. And so it was a mixed region. Of, of people and ethnicities. And at that time, people liked to be segmented off away based on that. And I mean, in our world too, too, if you are poor, you have a different skin color, you don't have power, or you don't have influence, there are many people who will look at you differently and who will look down on you. This was true in Galilee as well. But look at the pattern of Jesus. Where does he go? He moves towards the despised people in the despised place and moves close to them. He pursues them. And so when we ask this question, could God love you even after all of your mistakes? The answer is absolutely unequivocally yes. That is the story of all of scripture. It lists out all these people who made all these mistakes. And then we learn over and over again that God was still faithful to them even when they were unfaithful to him. Over and over again, we see that. And so even for you, if you feel like I have made so many mistakes and even other people look down on me because of what I have done. They judge me because they know some of what I've done. My, my sins span from here to Las Vegas <laughs> and, and maybe a lot in Las Vegas. I, I don't know. But here's the thing. The, the truth is that God's grace is, covers the whole world. It's way, way bigger than any mistake that you have ever made. If you are the last, if you are the lost, or you are the least, Jesus 
actually wants you. That is the gospel, and that is good news. Now, it's important for us to recognize that each of us are called, we are invited, and we are pursued by Jesus. And then when we are adopted into his family, when we place our hope and our trust in Jesus, we become what's called a disciple of him. And there were those first 12 disciples, but, but Jesus actually invites every single person to become a disciple of him. And sometimes uh, there's words used in church, uh, like churchy words, that uh, you can be like, I, I don't really know exactly what that means. So I, I want to break down what is actually a disciple and, and what does that look like? So um, I, I think about the best word that I can think of in our modern context for a disciple is somebody who is an apprentice. If you're a disciple, you're an apprentice. So I think of like somebody like a plumber. Uh, some plumbers go to more traditional schooling and things of that nature, but many of them go and they actually learn the trade on the job. They watch somebody doing something. They, they learn how to replace the toilet and put the new one in or, you know, all the, all the things, all the skills that a plumber has and um, keeps our house, houses looking and smelling <laughs> better, <laughs> okay? But... Um, so so the, the best thing that we can think about is that a disciple is like a pre an apprentice. I have a brother-in-law, and he is an electrician. And one of the things that'll happen for me anytime I'm doing any sort of electrical work around the house is I'm always a little nervous because I'm definitely inexperienced and over my head. Um, but I'm always like, I, I, can, I can do this. And I'm not, for those of you judging right, right, me right now, I'm not talking about changing a light bulb, okay? I can do that and I don't have to make the call. But anything else uh, pretty much beyond that, I'm always like, ah, does, do these wires connect? I'm not so sure. And every, what happens inevitably, every single time I'm halfway through the project. I'm like, I think this is right, but I'm not 100% sure. So I hit the FaceTime and uh, my brother-in-law will pick up the phone and he will walk me through. This is what you need to do. This is how you need to do it. This is the best way to do it. Um, and, and for me, when he's talking to me, I have full confidence and full trust that what he's saying is better than what I think and better than I could come up with. This is what it means to be an apprentice of Jesus. It's to say, I don't know everything in this world, but I, I, I am choosing today to trust in the one that I follow, Jesus. This is what discipleship is. This is what it means to be an apprentice of him. Now, it would be amazing enough for every single one of us here to simply say, Thank you that you are God and that you love us and that you have forgiven us. Like that would be enough to sing his praises over and over again uh, because of how good he was to us, even when we weren't good to others or even to him. But what's, what's amazing about God is he offers each and every one of us so much more than even just forgiveness. And that would be enough unto itself. Jesus actually wants you and I to live a life of purpose. And he invites us into that. Each and every single one of us have been given a purpose from God. And some of that is unique to us and how he's wired us and how he's gifted us. And some of that is just all of us have broad, similar uh, purposes that God has given to us. Some of these more broad examples might look like serving others or working for the prosperity of our city, enjoying time with friends, enjoying God's creations, creating healthy families, enjoying good food and drinks, including, yes, that overpriced pumpkin spice latte. <laughs> that glorifies God, I think. <laughs> Create peace and joy with others. Use your money on things you enjoy. Use your money to bless others and simply enjoy God. God gives each and every one of us this purpose in our lives. And he, he talks about this all throughout scripture. And we can find this when we study and, and learn his word and write it on our hearts. Jesus even said, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full, have it abundantly. Like that was part of Jesus's mission for you and for me is to live a life of purpose. 
So part of this purpose is for us to enjoy his world, his creation, and our lives together. But there's another facet to our purpose. And here's what he says. Jesus says in Matthew 4, 19, come follow me and I will send you out to fish for people. And I will tell you this church, this is a facet of following Jesus that I think there are many times that we are missing out on in our lives. This, this facet of being somebody who is sharing our faith with other people. And, and I, don't, I don't come here uh, with, with judgment over that. I come with a challenge and an encouragement today that um, you and I are actually made to proclaim the goodness of God. That is part of our life's mission that we have been given by God to do. And I will, I will tell you this, like I'm, I'm concerned that there's a whole segment of us that are, are missing out on the good things that God has for us because we're not stepping into this facet of our purpose that God has for us. I, I, as I was thinking about this passage in this last week, I asked myself a question. How many times have you shared your faith in the last five years? And I will tell you that the answer I had, I was dissatisfied with. And it, it kind of was like one of those giving me a kick in the pants that Jesus said, come, follow me, and I will teach you to fish for people, to go and share his love, to be a proclaimer of his goodness in a world that is longing for direction and purpose and life to the full. We have a hope and his name is Jesus. If you believe it, would you say amen? Amen. amen. So I, I, wanna, I want to try to expand a bit our definition of what evangelism looks like, because I know that there are real hurdles that exist for you and for me for why we don't end up sharing our faith with others. And, and there's, there's a whole laundry list. Like none of us want to be like the, the, we imagine the person with the bullhorn on the street corner. Like that's not what I'm talking about us becoming. Or we, we think about like, I don't want to be associated with those other people or, you know, there, there's a whole, I don't want people to reject me. I, you know, there's, there's a whole list of reasons why we don't share our faith. But I want us to think bigger than simply just being somebody who started making proclamations that nobody was interested in hearing. So I, I was thinking about a, a common situation that happens in, in my life and in yours. And somebody will come up to you and they will say, oh man, I am, I'm just having this really hard time with this situation in my life. I'm having a problem here at work. Um, there's, there's, I have struggles at home. Like this is a common conversation that you and I walk into and have with our coworkers, with our friends, people that follow Jesus, people that don't. And this, I think, is actually a real opportunity for us to ask a simple question, which is just, would it be okay with you if I prayed for that this week for you? And sometimes what happens when we, when we ask just a simple question to somebody who's going through something, it opens up a door. And, and we're not the ones who kick down the doors. And I know that sometimes when we open a door and we step in, sometimes we're uncomfortable because we don't know what's behind that door and we don't know what's going to happen. So let me do this for you. What, let's, let's play out. What if this was the like worst case scenario where somebody comes to you and they're like, I don't, I don't believe in that stuff. Like, are you kidding me? You believe in that foolish stuff. And maybe somebody criticizes you for your faith or for believing in that. And, and I don't want to minimize that that um, can be very uncomfortable. Like I, I feel you. I've been in that situation. Not desirable, not what I want. But if, if we play out the worst case scenario is that somebody says some things that maybe make us a little bit uncomfortable What's the flip side of that coin? What is possible if we actually share about the goodness of God? Or if we even just say, could I pray for you this week? And even if somebody says to you, ah, you know, I don't, I don't really believe in that stuff. Uh, you know, it could be a chance to, hey, I'm, I'm not here to try to like 
push something on you that you don't want. Like that's not my job. That's not my role. I can just tell you what prayer has done for me and has meant to me in my life. Sometimes I'll even ask permission. Like, would, would you be cool with me sharing that? If they say no, I respect them. I'm, I'm not going to try to push something on that. But sometimes people will say, yeah, but tell me about it. Okay. And then I'll say, you know, honestly, there have been times where I prayed and I, I just like, I got an insight that was totally different than what I would have come up with on my own. And maybe for you, you chalk that up to a coincidence, but I can just tell you this has happened over and over and over again in my life. And I'm just grateful that God hears me when I call on him. It could just be something as simple as that. Or maybe it's that somebody's going through a hard time in their life. It's like, hey, um, could I just pray that God would comfort you? Because his word says in Isaiah that God is near to the brokenhearted. So like, even though right now you might feel like you are isolated and alone, the truth is, is that God is actually near to you. Maybe it's even the message that we just talked about earlier. God, Jesus is somebody who pursues you. He doesn't even wait. He comes after us. We love because he first loved us. Like this is the very character and nature of who God is. That is being somebody who is fishing for people, who is being a person of hope and life and light to a world that is longing for it. Or let me uh, give you a, another example. Somebody says to you, if God is so good, then why did this young person pass away? And I, I will tell you that those are those questions that are uncomfortable and that are really hard and that are really sensitive, especially in the moment when somebody is going through that. That is an opportunity for us to lean in with deep empathy and start by just simply saying, I am so sorry for what you are going through. And sometimes, honestly, that's all that needs to be said is I'm going to be here with you. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to love you. Like, can I make you a meal? Can I, you know, whatever it is, like, I'm just, I'm going to, I'm going to love you because Christ loves you. And maybe I say that overtly, or maybe I just, I do that with my actions. But there are times where God is giving us an opportunity and we might be able to say something like, hey, when you are in this spot, when you are feeling so hurt and so distraught and so destroyed, I want you to know that it was never supposed to be this way. You know, and, and maybe it's not time for a theology lesson or maybe it is. I don't know. But maybe you say to them and say like, hey, like sin invaded this planet and now it's all messed up. And what I can tell you is that like this world is so, so broken, so, so broken. And I am so sorry for what you are doing or what you are going through. But can I just tell you this, that God is here with you. God loves you. In fact, the shortest verse in all of scripture Jesus wept. Jesus is actually weeping with you. He feels your pain. He is near to you. He loves you. He cares for you. And here's the thing, is all the wrong and all the death and all the nastiness we've experienced in our lives, one day Jesus is coming back again and he's going to make all things right. And I'm not expecting that you're going to go through all of these things in every single conversation. There's not like some formula that you need to follow. What you need to follow is Jesus and the Holy Spirit in him leading you to make us fishers of men, fishers of people, that we actually step into the doors that he has opened to us to be somebody who is a proclaimer of the goodness of God. So I, I want to invite the worship team back out, but I, I want us to think about this, this question first, because I think that one of the things that can happen for us is we can start to think and feel that like, okay, if I'm just like a, a good person, like that'll just attract people to me and they'll, they'll want to follow Jesus for that. And there's definitely some truth to that. But I think there are other times that God is actually inviting us to actually be fishers of people. Fishing is an actual like active thing. Like you got to reel it out. You got to reel it in. You got to put the net in the water. Like there's 
There's an activity to it. There's an intentionality to it. And what I don't want for any of us today is to walk away and just only ever be in a position where we're waiting for others to come to us. The truth is, is that Jesus came and pursued you and for me. And part of being an apprentice of Jesus is walking in his footsteps, operating to the best of our ability like he has instructed to us. And so I wanna give you a, a moment to be able to reflect this morning with two questions. What is holding me back from telling others about the hope of Jesus? And what is made possible for others when I share Jesus with them? And I actually just wanna to give you a moment, you can, if you have paper and pen, you can take it out. Um, if you uh, have a phone, you can even jot it down. That way you can think about this later. But I'm actually gonna give you the gift of time this morning to be able to think about this, to be able to reflect on this, and then to be able to talk to God about it. So let me just give you a minute or two to be able to process that question. Church, you are forgiven, you are invited, you are pursued, and you are loved by Jesus who came back for us. Now, he has invited us into the greatest mission of all, to go and to make disciples, to share his love and to proclaim his goodness through the ends of the earth. He has called and equipped you and I to be his light. So would you pray with me? God, would you help us with this to, to be people who could go and make apprentices? Would you help us uh, with, the, with the barriers that seem to be in place, sometimes even the lies that we can believe? Would you help us to go to proclaim your truth and your love? in any sphere that you call to us. God, we believe that you are the actual hope of the world to a world that is actually longing and looking for answers. So would you give us today the strength and the courage and the boldness, not to be people that kick down doors, but simply walk through the doors that you have opened up for us to be able to walk through. God, we're grateful that we are not the ones who can try to convince or change a heart. You are the God who does that. But God, we thank you that you have allowed us to be able to actually partner with you to share your love in this world. Give us the strength, give us the courage, and Lord, open up the opportunities for us to do that. Even in this coming week, Lord, we want to know and walk with you follow in your footsteps. And all who agree with that prayer said, amen. Amen. Church, would you stand and would you sing with me? And let's proclaim about God's goodness and what he has done for us.